What up guys, this is Characters and another weirdo ridiculous cartoon can only mean another weirdo ridiculous video. This is a new series, I've been starting about a bazillion new series of late. I'm going to have to stop doing that and actually start fleshing out some of the ones I've started. But this is one that I just felt was too important not to do. It's called Face Your Fears and it's going to be a series about all the spots in poker that my students um, in particular just hate to play basically. The spots that they're commonly saying to me characters, this spot sucks, I don't want to be in this situation, um, it's so bad, basically. And I want to basically say, well, don't be afraid of this situation and show them that when you rationalise it and you develop a strategy and an approach to these uncomfortable situations in poker, that they're not actually so bad after all. And uh, just because the spot, mainly this is important, that when a spot feels uncomfortable, it doesn't mean that it's actually minus EV, it just could be a difficult spot to play or a spot that just feels a little bit weird to play but is in fact fine from an EV point of view. So that's what we're going to look at in this series and today we're going to look at Big Blind versus Button in particular. Um, so this is like the situation where the button opens and Hero is in the Big Blind that he flats and he's having to play out position post flop and that can be really really scary at first especially when you're not used to playing, you know, you first get taught ABC aggressive poker you raise more hands in position than out of position, you play strong ranges out of position, you have the initiative when you're out of position mainly. So going from the very ABCs of poker to actually playing in like the most plus EV way as you move up in stakes and actually start becoming a real poker player, it's scary and you do have to get used to situations where you are playing post-flop out of position without the initiative. So we're going to start today with the most common one in poker that fits that breed, which is Big Blind versus Button, and I've filtered in my database for some interesting spots, basically, where I defend the Big Blind against the Button open by flatting, and then we play the flop out position. And I want to start by giving you guys a quick presentation about um, a very short slide, basically, just to show you guys the kind of model we're going to be using in this spot when we don't have any info, and just to show you guys that it's not as scary as you might think. And secondly, then I'm going to dispel a few myths about this situation, some things that People will say to me that my students have said to me in the past, like recurring logical failures that people might think uh, make the spot really bad and one that should be avoided at all costs. But you can't avoid this spot. You have to play some hands from the big blind against button. There just are hands that are, especially against the lower sizes from the button you're seeing these days, that are just higher EV to call than they are to fold that are not suitable three bets. And there are a load of hands that fit that bill. So we better get used to playing those hands so that we don't suck big blind versus button and so we can reduce our red line losses and defend our big blind optimally and just improve in this situation. This forest here is pretty scary. Like, I don't know about you guys, but if I was walking down the path and then I suddenly saw this, I would be pretty freaked out. I mean, like, I don't even know what that one on the, the right, that tree on the right is doing, but I don't want to be anywhere near that guy, I can tell you. Neither does this guy in the video. And have you ever heard the, the common saying that the best way to get rid of phobias is just to face up to them? Like the girl who's afraid of spiders has to eat a spider and then it's not so bad after she's chewed through that big tarantula and sort of got all the little hairs from its legs out of her teeth, then she's not going to be scared of tarantulas so much after that. Similarly for this poor, really skinny, really tall guy with the tiny body and massive legs, he's going to be, you know, if you had that small a body and those lanky legs, you wouldn't really want to emphasize it by wearing two massively contrasting colors like that, would you? It just can't be so good. His complexion there, you can see he's like yellow faced. He's I think that's just to, the the pale complexion is to represent the fact that he is so terrified he's about to pass out. He's like totally whiteying here. He's like lost his ability to even walk straight. So fortunately for him, the carrot man is there and he's saying, fear not, come into these trippy, weird woods um, with me. Um, if you didn't know what this was about and you just saw this cartoon, or if you were this guy, you might think you'd been taking a bit of LSD or magic mushrooms or something because you're going towards these creepy trees with a giant carrot with a carrot goatee holding your hand. You might just think you may have swallowed something that might be a bit of a hallucinogen. I don't know. Let's um, get into the flesh of it because I'm actually on a bit of a time constraint today because I'm about to do my Twitch channel. Shortly after this, I'm going to be streaming some live poker stuff, so I need to be there for my audience so that I don't disappoint. So let's get through this. Um, here's a pyramid. This is something I use in my book. Um, so please don't steal it. It's basically an idea... It's, it represents the idea of what we should do when we're playing hands without the initiative, facing multiple bets from, from our opponent, and out of position. This can apply to the big blind versus button spot that we're going to be talking about in this video. So the idea is that when you 
before you narrow your range in any way, that's to say before you actually call a flop, you're dealt 100% of hands on average. So your range pre-flop, when you're just in the big blind and nothing has happened yet, you haven't acted yet, is 100% of hands. That's at the very bottom of the pyramid. That's what you start with. Then there are some hands that you three bet pre-flop and there are some hands that you fold pre-flop versus an open. So those ones will leave the pyramid. They'll go out of there. And the only ones that will be left will be the next tier, the next tier of the pyramid. I say tier because I used to deal roulette and one section of the wheel is called the tier section because it's like French and stuff, but tier is the English word. Um, so the next tier of the video is the preflop calling range. These are the hands that Hero doesn't three bet preflop, doesn't fall preflop, the ones he actually calls with. Then above that, we've got the flop calling range. So Hero calls, he checks, he faces a C bet and he doesn't know which which kind of range he should continue with here. You know, like, do I call? Do I fold? Do I raise? What do I do? Help. It's a scary spot. Well, he should have a range that he's calling the flop with that represents a portion of, but not all of his preflop calling range. That way he's kind of balanced, he's folding an appropriate amount to a c-bet, depending on what that c-bet size is. He's folding the percentage that makes villain c-betting, you know, as neutralizes villain c-betting as much as he can in that spot with this range, basically. And then the turn comes and villain bets again. Woe is me, now I'm out of position with the marginal hand, I'm on the turn, what should I do? Well, maybe if your hand's towards the bottom of your range, you can just fold it. And you don't need to worry about that because you're playing your range overall and you don't need to fret about the fact that you folded something near the bottom of it. That doesn't mean you're being exploited. In a vacuum, it might feel like you're being exploited because he made you fold your second pair, bad kicker. But in reality, when you call that flop, you've already narrowed your range. Your range has a lot of stronger hands than the one you're folding on that turn. So you can you can rest assured that you're continuing with enough of your range as long as you're calling the more the better hands um, in that range, basically. Then you get to the river and the same thing happens. And Relin bets again. And again, you have to fold apart your range. Again, the pyramid shrinks. Again, the percentage of the hands you actually call the river bet with is going to be smaller than those you had in the turn. Now, this is balance. This is what it means to be balanced. Your range gets narrower and narrower by, you know, with every street as your opponent's betting range contracts and gets narrower and narrower him himself. So, given that this is all happening, it makes sense that as his range shrinks, our range also wants to shrink um, for us to be balanced and not be leaving a gaping hole in our game that our opponent can can destroy. So if we were, for example, just continuing with 100% of hands all the way through the hand, we'd be hellishly unbalanced and never ever folding if that pyramid didn't get any smaller and it was just a big rectangle coming out of the ground from here up to here and it was just 100% of the hands all the time, that would be unbalanced and our opponent could exploit us by just value betting everything and thin value betting and never ever bluffing and he could kill us that way or devising some strategy that was doing that and to whatever ratio he wanted to use where he thought we wouldn't adjust and blah 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 but you get the picture he can form an exploitative strategy there and he can he can kill us basically similarly if this was shrinking too much and it started here then it suddenly just went zoop, zoop, like that and made a kind of I'm thinking about like some kind of like scientific flask that you might see that has this kind of shape. I should really just draw with paint to show you guys what I'm talking about. You get the picture. Imagine this is like a beaker or a flask and it just gets really narrow at the top. In that situation, we'd be folding too much in the later streets and then Velen could over bluff the turn and over bluff the river and would be able to exploit that by just bluffing too much or bluffing more than would be balanced with his own range. So what does all this mean? It means that when we don't have any info, we can try to just emulate a balanced strategy as much as possible against a regular and basically just be looking to continue in a pyramidal way where our range gets proportionately smaller as we get towards the river, but not so much that we're overfolding any one street. We're just folding a chunk of our range on each street that makes Velen kind of indifferent to whether he bluffs us or not. So this is a this is what you do when you have no other information and it kind of takes the sting out of the pain of um, playing out of position because at least when you know that overall with your range you're not being exploited and you're playing in a balanced way that's just sort of you know you're just formulaically kind of churning out money because you know that calling the big blind with this hand is better than folding and you're playing in such a way or calling the big blind with a range is better than folding that range and then you're playing that range post flop in some way that um, basically is going to be fine and it's not going to be like leaking you money even if your opponent is over bluffing or under bluffing certain streets it doesn't matter because we're playing in a balanced way that negates the profitability of that for him. We're basically making it the case that no matter how often he chooses to bluff us, he's not actually making much of an EV gain, if any, from a balanced strategy that he could deploy himself. So 
we're negating any kind of imbalances in his game from being effective against us. And that's a good starting point, and that's what balance is. And you should always be looking to change the shape of this pyramid when you pick up different info. So when you learn that your opponent, in fact, is a crazy fish who bluffs the turn with 100% of his flop range, well, you, should not be flop you shouldn't be calling flop and folding turn with anything, because you should be just going all out exploitative against that fish and trying to own him by just continuing with your whole flop range on the turn and bluff catching the river really, really wide and all sorts of stuff. Similarly, if it's a net unit who never see bets the flop, you should overfold the flop. You should fold like some weak second pair combos on the flop because you know he's just see betting top pair and better. Um, and then you'd have a balanced an imbalanced range, but that would be fine because you're trying to exploit your opponent's unbalanced range. So this is your default pyramid, but always look for ways to deviate from it when you get more information. It's just this whole balance versus exploitivity thing again in poker. Here are a few myths that I really just want to dispel. Here's one, we're playing guessing games. Well, if you try to think, people say, I'll just explain this, people like to say that if you're playing out of position, you're not taking many actions to narrow your opponent's range or give yourself a better idea of what he has. So you're not like raising for info or you're not like, I don't know, three betting pre-flop to find out where you're at. And you guys know I hate that saying. If you've watched enough of my videos and I explained why a couple of videos ago in Bad Poker Logic episode one, two videos before this, but anyway, go back and watch that if you haven't, it's probably quite useful and a little bit related. But we're not playing guessing games, um, because, well, we might be, but we're not trying to figure out what villain's hand is. We don't want to narrow villain's range in a way that's negative EV, like making him only continue with better hands. So our aim is not to soul read what his hand is. So if you want to try and be psychic, of course you're playing guessing games. Just like if you came to me and said, what does my future hold? and then my goal was to like actually look into your future, I would be playing guessing games because I can't do that. I'm not psychic. I don't have that ability. But in poker, we're not trying to be psychic. We're not trying to put our opponent on a ridiculously narrow range of hands. Um, we can't do that. It's impossible. So we need to put him on this whole range, like all the hands he takes X action with. So we're not playing guessing games because we're not trying to actually guess what his range is. We're just trying to play our range in a solid way. That means whatever he's doing, it's not going to be that effective against us. It's not going to be overly effective against us. Of course, like when we get other information, then we can actually start like saying what his range is and adjusting to that. But when we don't know his frequencies, let's not play guessing games. Let's just formulate a pyramid and play like this and just play balance. That's fine. If you call flop, you have to call turn. No, you don't. The whole point of the pyramid is that there are many hands in the flop calling range that shouldn't call turn, because if you call turn with your whole flop calling range, you'd be ridiculously unbalanced, and what you'd be doing is you'd be over-calling on the turn. You'd be folding 0% to a turn bet. And what that would do in theory is it would mean that your opponent could print a lot of money against you by just never bluffing the turn and always value betting and value betting quite thin. So if you actually believe this, you're playing insanely unbalanced and you're offering your opponent on a play a strategy to just counter you and make lots of money from you. And it'll be quite obvious that you never fold the turn as well because he'll play a few pots with you and just see that you don't fold the turn. You can't call just to check fold the flop blocks. You can if the price is good enough. If someone min raises against you from the button, there's nothing wrong with defending a hand in the big blind. You're going to have to fold 60, 65% on the flop. Um, that's okay as long as your pot odds are good enough. That's like a min open, you have some implied odds, your pot odds justify it. Calling doesn't need to be amazing. I'm not trying to like win the world every time I call. I'm just trying to improve upon folding. If you want to lose 100 BBs per 100 by folding, that's okay. But I would rather call and check fold most flops and then lose like 80 or 90 instead and be making a bunch of money in the long run. Um, so I've got some hands here. I was going to show you guys like my results actually and show you guys like what I've changed in the last sort of 100k, not 100k, like last sort of 30k hands and how it sort of affected my red lines. I've just been defending my blinds like even more than I used to and it's been good so far. Um, but I don't really think I have time to do that without messing around in Poker Tracker a bit too much and changing a bunch of filters. I don't really want to do that, but I'll do that in a future episode for sure. But trust me when I say that um, I've been winning at like 4 or 5 BBs per 100 over the last 100k. Over the last 30 or 40k, it's been more like 8. Um, and that's, I think, because the red line's improved a lot and also will be good variance too. But I definitely think that defending more has helped me in that respect. So this is going to be our plan when we don't have any info. We're going to be using this pyramidal calling strategy. And you guys are going to see this. There will be exceptional flops on which we're going to develop a raising range. And we still have the same idea that we 
have a calling range that shrinks as we go forward, but we also have a raising range that's part value and part bluff and possibly shrinks as we go forward and then it stops bluffing at the hand when called at various points. So whether you're calling or whether you're betting, you can still have this pyramidal kind of range. Like Villain has this kind of range against us when he's betting. He bets the flop with 80% of hands, but then he only bets the turn when called with 60% of those and so on. His range shrinks and shrinks as he gets the river just like ours does. So this idea is not just for calling, it's also for, for betting and all sorts of things. Any situation in poker where range is narrow from street to street, you can apply this kind of pyramidal um, structure to explain what's going on. Let's have a look at some concrete examples because life is always better with concrete examples. You guys can know exactly what I'm talking about. This first hand is not anything exceptional. It's basically just a hand um, to show where we are in the pyramid and why it's okay for us to basically fold a flop. So let's just get into it. We're in the big blind and the button 2.5x is the small blind calls, which I think is a mistake because he shouldn't have a calling range here against us because we're going to squeeze too often for that to be good for him. I really need to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me, guys, it's hay fever season. So for any, any hay fever sufferers, will probably sympathize that there's like pollen in the air and it's making me sneeze. Um, anyway, so we need to basically call here. This guy shouldn't have a flat range, but that's kind of beside the point. We need to call here because our hand is not really good enough to squeeze for value and it would be a kernel send to turn it into a squeeze bluff when there are just so many weaker hands we can use to squeeze bluff here. So this is just a clear call. And then we see the flop and we check the flop. You could lead here, but I probably won't have a leading range on this board because it's a little bit too dry and it's likely he's going to see about this quite a lot even though we are three ways. So I'd rather just check with my range and let him do that. When I have value, it's better for me. And if I lead here, you know, I am three way. I might not have the most fold equity in the world. So I might just prefer not to have a leading range here. So he bets and this guy folds and it comes to us. And you might say at this point, if you call pre, you have to call flop or you can't call pre just to fold the flop or we're playing guessing games. We don't know if he has it. All these things are true. If I try and put this guy on one hand, I don't know what he has. So I would be guessing, but I'm not going to try and put him on one hand. I'm going to use my pyramid and I'm going to say, Okay, I don't need to defend as much on the flop because it was three-way and the burden of defense is split between me and the small blind. It's not me that's incurring all of this. So theoretically speaking, I don't need to defend as much as this bet to pot ratio says I do. So that means I can fold a bit more of my range. And I think that also this guy won't be c-betting this as light as he would be heads up. So again, I don't the burden to defend so much is not there. And so I can actually shrink my range quite dramatically going from my pre-flop calling range to my flop calling range because we're three-way, everyone's playing a bit more honestly. It just takes away this need for me to like get super out of line. So it's absolutely fine for me to fold this part of my range here because the three-way nature of the pot means that I don't need to defend so much. If there was a fish in the pot as well, I would have to defend even less because it would just make everyone else so much even more honest, basically. If this guy was a fish in the small blind, the button's not going to be c-betting that as wide if there's a fish that never folds the c-bets, for example, in a small blind, then I can defend even, even less of my pre-flop range and I can make my pyramid like exploitatively smaller. So already, you can see we're deviating from the normal pyramid. We don't have any info here specifically on villain other than he's c-bet three out of four times so far. Um, we don't really know what his range is, but that's fine. But just because we're three-way, we can already make an exploitative adjustment to our balance strategy and say, okay, we're going to defend a bit less than we would on average because this guy probably isn't bluffing as much. It's just a population. We, we don't need to defend as much, both theoretically speaking and exploitatively speaking, when we're three-way here. So this is just a fine spot to fold to a c-bet. Simple spot, boring spot, yes, but I think it proves the point. Um, that is okay. It's just hugely plus EV for me to call there and fold the flop. Don't get stuck in this one hand vacuum where you think, oh, is that bad? Because we called on one street and folded on the next. It's absolutely not bad. It's totally fine. If you look at the overall EV tree, lots of good things could happen there. So don't get stuck in one branch of the tree where the worst thing happens where we have to fold the flop or one of the worst things that commonly happens happens. Think about the whole EV tree and all the times we hit the flop, pick up a C-bet from his C-betting range or even better, you know, turn the nuts and get a bunch of value. There's just so many other things that can go on in the EV tree, basically, so we don't really need to worry about it when we're just on one bad branch. And our good pot odds pre-flop mean that 
we don't need good branches to occur all that often. The good branches, this is kind of vague, but the good branches don't need to come along all the time because our pods are so good pre-flop. So even if we fold the majority of the time or play kind of badly, or sorry, play kind of fit or fold, not badly, but even if we play kind of fit or fold there, like we probably should three-way, it's still hugely plus EV for us to call a hand as good as Ace-9 suited and plenty of worse hands too in that spot. Okay, next one, another 2.5x. Obviously, the bigger the open, the wider you should... Um, the tighter you should defend, and the smaller the open, the more hands you should defend. This is a clear call, I think, to uh, 2.5x and a 3x and a min open. Doesn't really, you don't want to stop calling this hand at any point unless your opponent opens hugely. Bear in mind we have 12 hands here, don't think this guy's a net, it's just too small a sample to know, he could just be a reg for all we know. We check the flop the top pair, and he bets. So here we flop actually something that's clearly in our flop calling range. I won't have a raising range on this board um, because basically, to summarize this kind of complex idea really quickly, I hope you guys can follow me here, um, I won't raise this flop with anything because I don't have range advantage here. I have like quite severe range disadvantage and that's because while both me and my opponent can have any set here probably, he can actually have queens plus and I can't and he can probably also have um, maybe like 10-4 suited and 7-4 suited, whereas I may not, because I might 3-bet or fold those hands. So, he has more good hands than I do, um, and the board is really dry. I don't need to be going for value immediately with my like good hands here. So, those two reasons combined kind of make me just want to check all my whole continuing range here, and that has the added bonus of protecting my weaker hands. If I'm check calling pocket 7s here, it protects hands like this, and my range are a little bit weaker. The pyramid in this case, because we are... Okay, wait, where are we in the pyramid here? Well, we're right at the top of our of our 100% of hands, so definitely, since we're at the top of it, we're going to continue on to the next street, and we're going to call the flop. So this hand is going to not just be in our pre-flop calling range, but it's going to be in our flop calling range too, and it's in fact so high up that it's actually going to be in our turn calling range also. Is it going to be in our river calling range? Is it so good that it reaches the very top of this pyramid? I don't think so, unless... Um, it improves or we think villain is over aggro and we should be over defending. I mean, it's close, it is up there, it could be a call on some runouts, but I just feel like the average villain isn't going to triple me that wide on this texture unless it runs out kind of, I don't know, scary or whatnot. So I think that we definitely have a call call fold plan, just putting it in this part of the pyramid but not in this part. So this is how I'm thinking about it, this makes the spot less scary, I'm giving you guys a kind of antidote to the the lack of knowledge that can be a bad thing out of position, basically. This is the antidote. Know that you're playing your range in a good way, basically. So we call flop. We check call his turn as well, and he bets turn. So we do. We check call flop and turn as planned. We check fold this river probably just against a random player, like in these in these stakes, because we do have some better hands here. We have like a few two pairs, like four or five suited and. Um, if this if we didn't have the queen here, we could have like our range would contain a lot of stronger hands than just a pair of tens here that we could call with. And my read against the population is I probably want to undercall the river a little bit anyway. So I'd rather just fold this hand, I think, if I didn't have two pair if I had like Jack Ten here and just fold this river. But now obviously our hand is so good that he can be value betting worse hands against us or bluffing us and we beat all of that. So folding is totally out of the question. And in fact our range versus this bet size in particular that our hand is so good versus this bet size in particular because this is probably just some guy thin value betting not balancing his range properly who just has like one pair max here so given that he's done this to his range and probably capped it this is a population read, he may not, he, this may just be his value size, his overall size, he could be balanced but it's unlikely because people suck at balancing so I think that he probably just has like one pair and no better most of the time and probably no bluffs either, he just has like thin value all the time. We should definitely raise for value, so I raised 18, he calls, he shows up with aces, probably around the top of his range, and we win the pot, so that hand is fine, but we use the pyramid just to decide how many streets we're gonna call, that's the that's the basic premise. Here we have a7 off in the big blind and we flat the men open. I think it's fine, you know, somewhere lower down in our calling range here, but not as good as Queen 10 suited was to flat, but certainly a hand that's too good to fold and a hand that we don't really want to 3-bet bluff. Like, okay, this guy folds 58%, that's a reasonable amount to 3-bets, and we would be polarised against him, so we would be 3-bet bluffing here. 
But we're not going to 3-bet a 7 off because if we just 3-bet all these hands that flop terribly that just have a single blocker, I think we're just going to end up 3-bet bluffing far too much. And we can call this hand, which, as you guys all know, if you watched my series 3-betting in 2015, it's kind of a cardinal sin to ever 3-bet a hand that you could flat when you have a polar range. So that's going to be a call. Of course we've flopped easily good enough here to be firmly within the flop calling range and the turn calling range right away. We can just tick those two boxes and say we're going to call those two streets because we're so high up in our range and so far ahead of the range he see bets this flop and turn with probably. Jack on the turn, not one of the best turn cards for us because 10-8 gets there, gut shots with Jack's in them get there and he picks up more equity with the double spade with some of his flop backdoor flush draws but that's okay, we can still check call again because we're too high up in our range to fold but this is probably a hand that will check call and fold river. Um, what would we check call and call river with? What would be in this portion here that just goes all the way here? Well, we'd continue on the river with any jack that we floated the flop with, like queen jack with a batter flush draw, um, ace jack, anything like that. De definitely any trips. And again, we do have trips in our range here because we're not raising anything. Definitely any 10-8, um, anything like any nuts. So I would probably just check call, check call, check, raise river with my nuts here and check call, check call. Uh, check call river with better showdown value probably i don't know i mean you could even call this hand on the river it's definitely close because it does block like sevens full and that you know the ace is fairly good as well for blocking things like ace jack that are part of his value range so this hand could even be like a call down here but given i think people under bluff the river a little bit in this spot i wouldn't call it blank river but that is not a blank river that is one in which our range now catapults our hand catapults right up to the top of this is just behind 9x it's the next best hand in our range basically our type of hand in our range so this river is going to need to be a call now and then our jack x here could even be we could even consider folding it i mean i, I wouldn't fold the jack here but you could consider folding more of your range here that isn't a seven on this card like you could consider folding some other pairs and stuff here like i don't know pocket sixes or something like that you could probably fold here um that card changes the board texture and it means that 7x shoots way up in your range and hands like Jack X and pocket sixes shoot down in your range because so much of your 7x has improved that they become a lower part of your range than they would be otherwise. So he bets and we just have a call here. Raising would be too thin because although he could value bet some more sands, like maybe maybe something like ace jack thin value or like a big over pair or something like that could be, or straight could be value bet here. I think that expecting these hands to call a raise is definitely optimistic and he has loads of 9x in his range too. So raising here is out of the question, it's just a slam dunk call, there's nothing else to do with it. But at that point, suddenly we have a raising range in the very top of a river. Continuing range becomes a raise for value. And if we want to be perfectly balanced there, the very bottom of our turn calling range that can't call the river would actually turn itself into a bluff in theory and try and make him fold. That would be how we'd go about having a completely balanced strategy there. There are some tensions that... I just wouldn't exploitatively, I just wouldn't bother having a river raising, bluff raising range on. Um, this is potentially one of them because I don't feel like there are a whole host of thin value hands he's going to bet here. I feel like the bottom of his range value range is in some cases like a 7. Um, so I think having a, a raising range here as a bluff is actually kind of bad and just you should just exploit that tendency in your opponents by just value raising this river only. I think that would be fine. Let's move on to the next one. Hopefully I'm not going too quickly. I'm just trying to make sure I cover enough in this video because I'm aware that I don't have like an hour to, I don't have a full hour slot to like devote to it. But I think we should get through enough just in 40 minutes or so. It should be totally fine and I can expand on it in the next episode. So this guy raises kind of in between the last two sizes we looked at, the main open and the 2.5x. So our calling range will be a little bit tighter than it was against the main open and a little bit wider than it was against the 2.5x. King Queen could be a 3 bet here. It's definitely close. I don't mind 3 betting this hand, but it's definitely on the on the fence, on the fringe of where I would stop calling and start 3 betting for value. King Queen suited a definitely 3 bet for value. It just flops amazingly. So, yeah, but I'll call this hand that's fine. And again, we're very, very near the top of the pyramid here. This is a hand we're going to just need to call 3 streets with. It's that simple. We don't have enough 3x to allow us to protect ourselves against getting tripled. Even if we want to slightly overfold the river, we still need to call a hand like this because we don't have enough good hands in our range to help us get to showdown otherwise. Like if we're only continuing with 3x on the river, 
then I know this is just the flop, but I'm thinking ahead, obviously planning the pyramid, then if we're only calling like 3x on the river, we're just not calling enough. We're allowing him to very profitably triple barrel bluff us, basically. So this hand is going to need to just be a call down. Again, no raising range here because he has range advantage. We don't really need to raise this for value with all that many hands. And we want to protect our calling range. So we're just going to go ahead and check call. That turn changes everything, throws a spanner in the works because now he's going to check back 8x. And our range, we now have range advantage on this card because it just means it's very unlikely he has queen x because he still has like basically his whole pre-flop range. He basically still has his whole pre-flop raising range. Change that word to raising, that's what he has on this turn because most people will just see about 100% of their range on this fairly dry flop. So while he can have 100% of the stuff he opened, which could be like 50% of hands in total from the button, we don't have anywhere near that much because we're probably, well, we might be like calling a little bit tighter than he's opening for a start but when we call the flop we actually have a queen just like enormously more often than he does so we actually want to grab the betting lead now because our range is ahead of his and we want him to basically we want to prevent him from defensively checking behind with like pocket sixes or ace high and these are hands he should certainly call a bet with we can also bluff this turn every time we floated here with a flush draw or like a backdoor draw or ace high or king high or something we can just bet so i probably just resort to leading my whole range on this turn card any fault, so that's fine. But our plan was to check call down three times unless a turn card came that gave us huge range advantage like this one does. This is one he's very unlikely to bluff and therefore if we're not getting bluffed a lot on it we don't care about protecting any kind of checking raise or range or anything like that. In fact we don't even need a checking range. We're just going to win the pot a lot with a bet when we have air and we're not going to get much value by checking anyway so we may as well just lead our whole range here. Um, so I like the way this hand was played. These spots are fairly automatic to me, like these common situations, so it's probably going to be kind of rare that I find a, a spot here that I don't like the way I've played it. The spots that I'll feel like that, I know the rarer, more exploitative spots where it's less obvious what I should be doing and what my strategy is, like the harder spots really. I find these spots like quite easy actually because they're just so common and recurring and I get so much chance to think about how to play them. So contrary to the guy who fears wandering into this creepy forest and like fears these spots, I actually think they're really easy to play and they can be reduced to a very simple kind of strategic idea when you don't have info to exploit your opponents, basically. So we get a mid open from a non-short stack, non-full stack reg, I'm guessing, or maybe even a fish. King Knight here is going to be a call. It's going to be good enough to call, but not good enough to three bet for value. So that's going to be a call. And then where are we now in the pyramid? Probably calling two here. Like we have middle pair with a back, with a good kicker and a backdoor um, heart draw, although it's not the best one. So we're definitely calling flop and we'll call turns on favorable turn cards and probably fold on bad ones. And then we'll never call river. That's okay. Some people are like afraid here, but you're not getting the showdown if you don't call river. That's all right. Because just as our range is contracting street by street, we expect our opponent's range to contract, our opponent's betting range that is to contract street by street as well. And we don't think that he's going to be betting the river with anywhere near the frequency of hands that he's betting the turn with, or especially that he's betting the flop with. So it's okay here for us to call flop, call turn, fold river. Don't hit me with that argument. If you call turn, you have to call river. No, you don't. That's just something that you might have heard that you're repeating or whatever. Not you personally, I just mean you here as in like the average person that I might coach and might say this to me. They just hear it and it sounds on the, on face value like good logic. Like if you call turn, you must call river because nothing changes on blank rivers. But that's not true. Just because the river's blank doesn't mean that nothing changes because what changes is the range of hands that your opponent bets at you as a bluff and it's ranked street by street unless you have a read that your opponent is just crazy and bluffing his whole range on a certain street. And that's quite exceptional, I think. That's not that common. So we call. See, I'm planning these hands out before, and when you know where you are in your range, you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to, like, call flop. Oh, we'll see what happens on the turn. Oh, no, what do I do now? Because you're already planned it. We've already said we're going to call good turns and fold bad ones. This turn is a good one because it actually, well, it's an okay one. It gives us extra outs against a bunch of his range, so this is one we want to call on. If we didn't have a heart, this would be a really bad turn, and it'd be one that we'd actually want to fold on. So... A good turn or a bad turn can depend on like what our kicker is and what suit it is and what comes on the turn for sure. So we call again and on this river I think we have enough queen eggs and enough flushes and enough good hands here that we can just fold if he bets here. Um, he checks back though and decides not to bluff here. I think it's a not a bad hand to bluff with as far as he's concerned. 
Um, if you think about it, he's very near the bottom of his range showdown value wise, and he does have the King of Hearts that reduces a bunch of the flushes that we can actually have here. So I think that he should probably bluff that hand. It makes sense, although I'm not sure. Maybe there are better hands to bluff, but that can't be can't be bad to bluff there anyway. I need to set and construct like a bluffing frequency for him there. But I think anything with a heart in it um, is going to be okay. Anything with like a king of hearts in it is going to be okay to bluff. Ace of hearts is even better because it blocks more of our flushes probably. We defend more off to ace x than we do king x, so we have more ace high flushes. Let's uh, do one more of these hands, then I need to get ready for my streaming uh, because I don't want to be too late for the audience on there. Check that out by the way, that's carrot underscore corner on Twitch which is, if you've not heard of Twitch, it's basically where people just stream themselves playing computer games. I do it for publicity mainly and to help people out. And yeah, I have a poker Twitch channel every Tuesday, UK time, 5 p 6 p.m. and every Saturday at the same time. So 5 p 6 p.m. UK time, UK time, Tuesdays and Saturdays. That's why my channel is on. Let's do one more. A7 of spades, and we call the men open from the same player that we just looked at, MDG uh, Black. So we just check fold this board, and I just included this hand just to say it's okay to call here and check fold because it's hugely plus EV, in fact, to call here and check fold. Well, it's not in a vacuum plus EV, but as a strategy, calling pre flop is just really plus EV. And unfortunately, when you get like a really bad board here where we just don't have enough equity to continue, there's just nothing to do here with check fold. We're not going to get the showdown enough with this hand for this to be profitable calling one street here. Like, it would definitely going to have to fold a turn. Obviously, that's fine. There are some hands you can call flop full turn with. You should have a range like that, but this hand is too weak to even call flop. Like, if we include this hand in it, we'd be folding too much on the turn, basically, it would make us unbalanced on the turn. Um, one final point is that there are some flops that you're just not going to be able to defend enough of to be perfectly balanced because say the flop is like king deuce deuce when you flat big big blind versus button. Unfortunately there for you, your range is just too weak and you can't defend enough without just spewing and defending loads of bad hands without the initiative. Um, sometimes you just have to accept your opponent has a very easy c bet against you. That happens. There are textures that are so favourable for him that he just can see bet his whole range and you can't really do much about it. That's okay though because it doesn't make your preflop call bad because it's just one branch on the EV tree. There are so many branches where the flop is one that you don't have to check fold loads on that your range doesn't suffer as much there as it looks like when that king deuce this flop comes out. All right, there's gonna be more spots in future videos. I've done big line versus button. I'm gonna approach similar spots in the same kind of way. Just talk about a strategy that we can use to sort of make us feel comfortable about playing these situations and not make us feel like we're, we're having to call flop and also call turn or call and then check folding loads, it's bad, or play guessing games. We're not doing any of that. We're just playing a coherent strategy. So forget this, forget this, forget this, and embrace this, wander into the spot, deal with it, figure out what your strategy is, and then you won't be afraid of it anymore and you can stop folding too much in the big blind and stop your red line crashing and take the, the generous blob-like hand of the carrot man and walk into the abyss to your almost certain death. That's why I would think. If I was walking into this forest, I'd be almost sure I was going to die. Anyway, this has been Characters for Grand School. See you in the next episode, and I welcome your comments and suggestions for the rest of this series. Good luck at the tables. Mm -hmm.